Hi, welcome to my presentation at Kansas Fest 2016. My name is Ken Gagney, and I will be presenting a session creatively entitled Steamed Apples, Modern Takes on Classic Games. You may know me from such magazines as Juiced GS, but I have, yay, and come back tomorrow around 5.30 to hear more about that. But I have other credentials to my name, including a couple of audio podcasts that I've been hosting for two years this month, and the one that is relevant today, to today's presentation is IndieCider. This is a, press, a bi-weekly podcast, airs the first and third Wednesday of every month, where I interview independent game developers. These are people who are creating games usually without outside financial backing or capital or investment. This allows them to retain control of their intellectual property, but it also robs them of the startup capital that they need to create a big budget game. However, there have been a lot of innovations in the past few years that allow developers to create games without that initial capital. Uh, one of them would be Kickstarter, for example. Kickstarter allows people to sell their games directly to the fans by asking them basically to pre-order the game while it's still in the conceptual stages. And that allows them to create whatever sort of game they see fit. Let me switch the uh, display here to mi not mirror. That would be helpful. Much better. Yay. Uh, an another big innovation has been digital distribution. Now, that's not necessarily a new thing. Uh, we've been able to download games to our computers for literally decades. But for video game consoles, for example, for many of those years, the main means of distribution was to go to the store, like GameStop or Best Buy, and physically purchase a CD or cartridge, go home, and plug it into your console. Our kids and grandkids will laugh that we ever had to leave the home to get a new game. Because now you can download games not only right to your computer, but also to your PlayStation, your Xbox, your Nintendo, your Game Boy, your iPhone, whatever. So there have been a lot of developers who previously couldn't get games onto the shelves at Toys R Us, but can now create games funded through Kickstarter and distributed through platforms such as Steam. And Steam is what I'll be talking about today. Steam is a digital distribution platform for PC, Mac, and Linux games. They do a little bit of other stuff like movies, but primarily they are a game platform. You just go to, I think it's steampower.com. It's run by a company called Valve, who make a few of their own games, such as Portal or Half-Life. But primarily, they are a distributor of other people's games. Think of it as like the iOS App Store, but for PC, Mac, and Linux, and ex exclusively for entertainment software. It is, uh, you download a Steam uh, console or for, for client, thank you, that's the word, a Steam client or front end for your computer, and then you just buy all your games through there. And there are a lot of advantages to having this primary distribution outlet. One is that you only have to give one company your credit card data, for example. And then you can buy all these games from hundreds of different developers and publishers. There is uh, a community involved. You can see what your friends are playing. Anytime I log into Steam and Andy's online, it tells me what he's playing or when he was last online and what game he was playing. I can see what games we have both played and who's doing better at them. And that can serve as a source of recommendation and discovery for new games. There are also trophies. When you do especially well at a particular game, you earn a trophy marking that accomplishment. And you can see how you've performed at different games over time, how you rank up against others, and what you haven't done yet that you can still do to clarify yourself as an expert at that game. There are also a lot of sales. The Steam Summer Sale is in full swing right now, and there are so many games that people buy for a very small amount of money because they know they'll never get it at a better price than right now, even if they don't have time to play it. So the Steam backlog is an issue that a lot of people face, where they have hundreds more games than they'll ever have time to play. That's not necessarily a bad thing. One of the things that the Apple II community taught me is support those who support you. There was one vendor who every year I would come to Kansas Fest and buy her one product at the vendor fair. Every single year I would buy it. I had like five copies of this program. I only, had ever, I only ever needed one, but I wanted to encourage her 
to make more software. Because even if that program wasn't the one I needed, the next one she made might be. And so I buy games from developers whose work I admire, whether or not I actually have time to play them. For an example of uh, what my Steam library looks like, I have uh, 247 games in my Steam library. I haven't played 203 of them. That means there are 34 games that I've actually played for a lifetime total of only 53 hours. There are people in this room who have spent more time than that playing a single game. And I've spent that much time playing 34 games. So obviously I have a collection issue. Some of these games were bought in bundles where I could buy like 10 games for 10 bucks. And I only really wanted one of them and that one game was worth $10 to me. So the other nine were sort of freebies. Also as a member of the press, I often get keys or codes to download Steam games for free. And I'll buy them and check them out maybe for a few minutes and decide, eh, this isn't really a good fit for my YouTube channel. Uh, a little bit more breakdown here. Um, 114 of the games I own, so almost half, cost between $10 and $30, which is actually a pretty good deal. If you go to GameStop and you wanted to buy a PlayStation 4 game, you're looking at $60 minimum, usually. So 10 bucks for a game is pretty good. Seven of my games I got for under $2. 34 games for under $5. 80 games for under $10. There is no game that I've played for more than six hours, though. So obviously, I have a fear of commitment. Please don't tell my significant other. I'm sure she'll figure it out. So uh, what I'm here to talk about today is not only Steam, but also how this correlates with the Apple II. As I mentioned, a lot of these independent game developers don't have huge resources. These are not AAA studios of hundreds of people with an art department and a design department and a production department. These can be two to 12 people working in a small co-working space, an office, or even their own homes to work on these games. Since they don't have huge budgets and huge pools of talent, their games don't look or act like the games you would buy at GameStop or Toys R Us. Instead, they look like other kinds of games that we all know that were developed by two to 12 people, or sometimes even one, which is Apple II games. So I'm gonna be showing you some Apple II games, seven of them, in fact. I'm gonna show you some Steam games that are very similar to them in gameplay or aesthetic. Basically, if you like this old Apple II game, you'll probably like this Steam game. I'm gonna show you seven Apple II games, and then 11 games that are similar to those. And I'm gonna break them down by genre. We'll start with point and click. Point and click has experienced a huge resurgence, resurgence in popularity, not just due to digital distribution or crowdfunding, but one other recent innovation in the last five to 10 years. Can anybody guess what it is? Touch, touch interfaces, tablets, iOS and Android. It's so much easier to point and click when you can just tap exactly where you want the person to go, tap the command you want them to execute. It's great. The big difference is that the point and click adventure games today often have puzzles with actual logic. Like in the old days, you would, how do I get the car to start? I put the cheese in the ignition. That makes sense. I sell the fish to the vendor so I can get the scarf to give to the lady who will buy me the mouse that I give to the cat who will not open the rope that opens the door. Of course, why didn't I think of that? That's old school gaming. There is much more sense to these modern games and a much better user interface. And I'll show you some comparison contrast. I'm gonna start with first person perspective games. That's where you're seeing the world through the character's eyes. So you don't ever actually see yourself in the game. Who knows what this game is? <coughs> Michael? Shadowgate. Shadowgate, yes. I think this is the Apple II version. I'm sorry, the 8-bit Nintendo version, which was actually the most popular version. It originally came out for the Macintosh in black and white, got ported to the 2GS, but eventually did come out for the 8-bit Nintendo and was really popular on that platform. So it's a point and click game. There is your inventory in the upper right, your view of the world in the upper left, and then all the text at the bottom here. <coughs> Let me see if I can uh, skip ahead in this video a little bit. Apparently not. Let's see. And uh, let's see. So this was, this was one of my favorite games. Uh, it's a very medieval setting. There's magic, there's monsters, there's dragons and warlocks. A lot of fun game. And so I'm saying that if you like Shadowgate for the Apple II on Steam, I think you'll like 
Shattergate. The original creators of this game went on Kickstarter and said, we want to resurrect this game from 20 years ago. It's not a reboot, it's not a sequel, it's a reimagining. A lot of the same levels, but also brand new rooms and maps, and they really did an amazing job. Here is a comparison video, I believe, that shows you the Nintendo game and the new game side by side. So Shadowgate is one of the many games I discovered through my own podcast. I interviewed the developers for my podcast. You can hear that interview in iTunes in audio format and also paired with gameplay footage on YouTube. My podcast is available in both audio and video formats. And in fact, this is one of the few IndieCider podcasts which you can also read because it was a cover story for Juice GS. Uh, there is exclusive content from the podcast that is only available on Juice GS and there is exclusive content that's only available in the audio edition. So they actually are different halves of the same interview. But the, Apple, the Juice GS version focuses on the Apple II aspects. Now I don't want to just show you modern remakes of old games, because I could actually do a whole session just on that. There are a lot of old school developers that have recreated their games, like Al Lowe, who recreated Leisure Suit Larry, which was also a cover story in Juice GS two years ago. I want to show you some original games as well. And so for a first-person point-and-click adventure game, <clears throat> I recommend Read Only Memories, which came out, I think, last year. And uh, as I mentioned, all these Steam games are available for PC, Mac, and Linux, but this game is also now available for PlayStation 4, or will be soon. And, and it is uh, set in Neo San Francisco in the year AD 2064. And you, discover, you stumble into a crime scene, a murder. Your friend has been murdered but he was working on an artificial intelligence robot named Turing. And Turing now helps you to solve the crime. So there is a map that you go around and explore. There are different areas that you sometimes need to travel back and forth in between as you collect new items and new clues and interact with people. Like there's a club that you go to where some people just won't talk to you because they don't know who you are. But once you get the right references, they will chat with you. <coughs> uh, this game is developed by a LGBT community. They put on the annual video game convention called Gamer X. And one of the ways in which they represent themselves in this game is not only through a diverse cast of characters, but at the beginning of the game, instead of choosing, are you a boy or a girl? Are you male or female? And then that's how people interact with you. They actually say, what pronouns would you like us to use when talking to you? And you can choose male, female, gender neutral, or you can actually create your own. It's a, uh, not, it doesn't really impact the gameplay per se, but if you are somebody who is looking to see yourself represented in a game that you have not traditionally been, this is a nice tip of the hat to acknowledge that there are a diverse audience of gamers. And if that doesn't interest you, then you just click the male pronouns and on with, on, go on your way. I'm sorry, that game was called Read Only Memories. R-O-M, ROM for short. And uh, sometimes it's mispronounced or misrepresented as ROM 2064, because that's the year in which the game is set, and I think that's also their Twitter handle. It's from Midboss Games. There will be links to all these games in the show notes, which will be my blog. And there will be links to that on the KFSD email list, <coughs> and Facebook, and Twitter. Another point and click genre is the third person. Again, it's an adventure game where you're looking at a world and you're clicking on where you want to go and what items you want to collect. But this time, you actually see your character in the world. And a classic Apple II game that is a third-person adventure game is King's Quest. Why isn't he moving? There he goes. <coughs> now, this is, of course, Sir Graham on his quest to become king. 
and here he is falling down a pit. And it looks like the, as the world is drawn in, in this classic Sierra online game, he hits some rocks, maybe finds a little pile of gold, or that could be sunlight, I'm not sure. And you type your commands in down here, so it's not exactly point and click. It's more like point and type. But this was a classic franchise that developed multiple titles in the series, all the way through the Apple II. I actually discovered it on the 8-bit Nintendo with King's Quest V. Uh, it was not the best interface to be playing that game with a controller, but I, w I wish I discovered it on the Apple II. <coughs> but it's a great game, and if you know how to solve it, you can solve it pretty quickly. There are what are called speed runs, where people try to finish the game as quickly as possible. And this game can probably be beaten in about an hour, if, <coughs> if not less. So if you liked King's Quest on the Apple II, then deja vu, you'll like King's Quest which just came out last summer. This is sort of a new model of distribution called episodic gaming, where you don't just buy the game once, you actually buy it five times. They release the first chapter last August, and then every two or three months they release another chapter. And what's nice is that this is not actually a reimagining. This works into the established lore of King's Quest. You play as Sir Graham again, but now you are like a 75-year-old king who is at the, in the twilight of his life, of his career, of his leg legacy. And he's telling his granddaughter the stories about his adventures when he was a young man. And the decisions you make as you play the game affect how the granddaughter deals with what she's facing. Like she might say, Grandpa, how did you deal with that dragon? And you might say, oh, I killed him. Or, oh, I set him free. And then she'll be inspired by that. And she'll either become a bully or a peacemaker. Now here's Sir Graham going down the well, just like you just saw, <clears throat> and this is him telling his granddaughter, here's what I did when I was Dr. your age. Brown from Back to the Future. And uh, he is voiced by Christopher Lloyd, better known as Doc Brown from Back to the Future. And what's great is that like, if, he, if you make a bad decision and he falls off a cliff and dies or gets eaten by a dragon, you'll hear his granddaughter say, Grandpa, that's not what happened. And Grandpa will be like, I was just checking to make sure you were listening. Here's what really happened. And then you go back and you try it again, and that time you survive. So it's uh, five episodes. I am not sure how many are out by now. I think all of them are. And you can usually buy all five at once. Uh, this is a game that I did not do for my podcast, but I did do what's called a Let's Play. If you attended my panel last year, my session at KFest, it's basically me talking about the game as I play it. In fact, if I were to turn the audio on right now, it'd just be me it's talking. Not exactly. That's Christopher Lloyd. So analog controls, I can walk or run. So that's me. Exciting. <clears throat> but again, I don't want to show you just reimagined classics. I want to show you some actual original titles. So here's a game I did do for my podcast called Kathy Rain. Just came out a few months ago. I saw it for the first time at PAX East, which is a video game convention in Boston. And I immediately fell in love with it as soon as I saw it. In fact, the developer came over and said, I saw you looking at my game. Do you want to play it? And I'm like, no, I don't. Because this is a video game convention. It's noisy. There are going to be people in line waiting to play it. And this is a game I really want to sink my teeth into. So I'm going to wait until it comes out in a week. I'm going to go home. I'm going to play the heck out of it there. And he's like, oh, OK, that's good. I'm glad you don't want to play my game. Uh, so unlike King's Quest, which was reimagined with modern graphics, and like Shadowgate, which also was, this game uses pixelated graphics, or pixel graphics, rather. Uh, it has a classic look and interface. The difference is it has voice acting. Um, this is a Let's Play, so it's, you're going to hear my voice, which is why it's muted right now. But Kathy Rain is a college student whose grandpa dies mysteriously, and she goes back to her hometown for the first time in 15 years since her parents got divorced and goes to try to figure out what exactly happened to him. Uh, there are three locations in this particular shot right here that you can choose between. Grandma's house, the sheriff's station, or the cemetery. And then you jet over there on your, bike, on your motorcycle. And you can point at things to see what they are, to look at them, to interact with them. There's a button you can hold down that will reveal every item in the room that you can interact with. Because in the old games, you would slowly move the cursor pixel by pixel, waiting for it to highlight to see, oh, there's something I can interact with. 
This game fixes that by you just push a button, everything gets labeled. Uh, the new Shadowgate also does that. Everything glows if you hold down a button. That way you don't need to try to figure it out. If you like that aspect of the game though, knowing that you have to figure out what to interact with, you can do that too. Here I am using my inventory to say, hey, try giving this item to the share. Maybe he'll recognize that. So really great game. This was created by, I'm sorry, this was created in the uh, game making program called Adventure Game Studio, AGS. You can download AGS for free and make your own point and click adventure games. In fact, people have used AGS to recreate King's Quest, and I believe they've even been done with permission from whoever holds Sierra Online now, which I think is Activision. Uh, <coughs> any anybody ever played an AGS game? Bill and James, uh, Jeff, Andy, any particular ones you want to shout out? No? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great tool. It's fun for creating games. And another game that was used by AGS to be made is uh, the Blackwell Legacy. So the Blackwell Legacy is not episodic, but there are like four sequels. Each one is a standalone game. And it's basically the sixth sense as a video game. You receive the action. Uh, you're, yes. you're a young woman whose aunt dies. And what you discover as you play the game is that you inherit the ghost that haunted her. Like, everybody thought she was going crazy and was suffering from dementia toward the end of her life. But once she dies, you start seeing the ghost that she saw. And this enables you to actually see other ghosts that don't know they're dead. And you need to figure out what you need to do to help usher them to the other side, to help them realize they're dead and come to peace with their fate. Uh, this was made by Wadget Eye Games. I was on a panel with him at PAX East last year. Great guy named Dave Gilbert. And in fact, he was hired to do the voice casting for Kathy Rain, which you just saw. He had already done all the Blackwell games, and the guy doing Kathy Rain said, I love Blackwell. I got to work with this guy. So they hired him to do the voice casting. Blackwell Legacy is available not only through Steam, but also for iOS. So again, the point and click interface is perfect for a game like this. Survival, another genre. Any questions so far? So that was the uh, point and click segment of my presentation. How am I doing on time, Andy? And when do I go until? Are you kidding me? I have three minutes? It's 3.30? When's the next presentation? Son of a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go late, sorry. I didn't, whoever thought that I could fit this into half an hour wasn't, didn't know what they were talking about. So Oregon Trail, of course, is one of the classic survival games where you're given limited resources and you have to get as far and do as much as you can with very limited uh, resources. And of course, everybody dies at the end, which is fun. By the way, there was a book that just came out by a modern day journalist who traveled from Independence, Missouri to Oregon in a covered wagon in the 21st century and wrote a book about it. The book is called The Oregon Trail. It's not about the game, it's about the Oregon Trail, which is amazing. That was Oregon Trail? Did he die of dysentery? No, he lived to write the book, <laughs> oddly enough. And uh, I don't remember his name, it's odd, but if you go to my Apple Two Bits blog, I wrote a post about it. Oh, I did not know that. I'll have to look into that. Philip it's what? His name's R. Philip Broussard. No, it's somebody else who wrote the book I'm talking about. Oh. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like Buckminster Fuller or something. Yeah. Uh, and then there's another game that I'm a huge fan of called Oregon Trail. <laughs> it's Oregon Trail set in the zombie apocalypse. And you're trying to get your station wagon from the east coast to the west without getting bitten and infected. Sometimes the people traveling in your car with you will get bit in and you will have to put them down before the virus takes hold. Uh, you can go hunting, just watch out for the zombie bear because he can't be killed. Uh, this game originally came out as a free Facebook game and then it got developed into a full-fledged iOS game and then it came out for Steam and PlayStation 4 and the developers have gone on to make other games <laughs> that were not as successful so they went back and started adding more features to this one. It's great. I tried to get free Steam codes to give to everybody 
who subscribes to Juice GS because I have like I have like 300 Oregon Trail. Oh, there, there he is putting his friend down. Yeah, there you go. I have like I have like 300 Oregon Trail postcards, each one for a different city that's been overtaken by zombies, and I just wanted to give them all out with free codes, but couldn't get couldn't get the codes. Great game though. Okay, another genre, platform. This t the, the name of this genre is often uh, deemed to come from Super Mario Brothers, where you're jumping from platform to platform. So it's an action game, basically. Uh, of, of course, the actual platform genre predates Mario, because Dangerous Dave, of course, for the Apple II, would be a platform game, <coughs> where you are jumping all around. Oh, no, go back. Play the actual video. Okay, maybe it's not a video. All right. Anyway, so that's Dangerous Dave. We all remember this from John Romero back before he did Doom, Quake, Wolf 3D. Oh, there he goes. Great. And you just collect all the treasures. Now, this game actually just came out for iOS. And you can swap between modern graphics and retro graphics. But it's not available for Steam. So even though there's a new Dangerous Dave, it's only available for iOS. The Dangerous Dave website says it's coming to other platforms, but it hasn't happened. So. A game that is like it that I want to recommend is VVVVVV. I think the website for this game is the letter V six times.com. I can never remember how many V's there are, but it's six. So the letter V six times.com. Made by Mr. Terry Cavanaugh. He's created some other great games I'm a big fan of. And very retro graphics. And besides up, down, left, and right, actually, it's just left and right. You have left, right, and switch gravity are your only buttons. Actually, there is a jump button as well. So it's a ton of fun. There are not many computer games I've actually played all the way to the end. This is one of them. And it's actually the very first game I ever tried to record a Let's Play of in my entire life. I didn't know the technology at the time. I couldn't get the audio and video synced. But this was a game I liked so much, I'm like, I want to share this with people. It, it looks hard. And Joseph is right that it's harder than it looks. <laughs> but whenever you die, you just. But whenever you die, you just start back at the beginning of that room, and and you have infinite lives. So you can try as often as you want. Sometimes it'll take you 50 tries to get through a single room. That part is murder. It's 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 brutal. Uh, yeah, it's great. So yeah, uh, somebody just said berserk. So very similar. So V V V V V V. That is the name of the game. The letter V six times dot com. That's true. This game is hard but fair, and that's one of the reasons I was able to stick with it to end. I never felt like it was cheating me, like some old Nintendo games might. Uh, Plang Man. Now, this is another one I did an Indiesider podcast about. And this is the only game where I'm cheating a little bit because it's not currently on Steam. I was putting this presentation together, thinking about how can I work this game into my presentation because it's so good. And while I'm thinking that, the, the developer emails me and says, hey, Ken, I'm thinking about putting my game on Steam. What do you think about that? I'm like, I think I just found my in. So thank you. Very timely email. Uh, in the meantime, it is actually available for free. There will be a link in the show notes, but you can download this game for PC, Mac, I think Linux, and it's absolutely free. <coughs> That's the trailer. It starts up with an Apple II boot screen and boot sound. So you can see that it got my interest very quickly. And it is basically a cross between like a Wheel of Fortune and a platformer, or maybe Boggle. You're trying to spell a word, and every and the level is made of blocks with letters on them. And you jump onto a block and you push the space bar, and if it's the right letter, <coughs> it'll fill it in. And if it's the wrong letter, that block drops away. And so you can actually die. Like, it's like Hangman. If you get enough wrong letters, there's nowhere left for you to stand, and you will fall to your death. The developer says that his main character design was inspired by Captain Goodnight for the Apple II. And when I interviewed him back in the spring, uh, I said, this is obviously inspired by the Apple II. You actually start with an Apple II boot screen. And he's like, yeah, I, I have an Apple II. I moved recently, and I had to move my Apple II. And I'm like, oh, I remember this thing. 
instead of putting it back in my attic, why don't I hook it up? He started playing it, and he's like, I want to make a game inspired by this. <clears throat> and I said to him, I actually go to an Apple II convention in Kansas every summer. He said, oh yeah, you mean Kansas Fest. I was like, that was the first developer I've ever met who I'd never heard of before who knew what Kansas Fest was. That was astounding. And so when he emailed me this past week, I said, I'm on my way to Kansas Fest. He's like, oh, have a great time. Say, say hello to everyone. So clangman.com, not for Linux, not on Steam, but free for PC and Mac. And the reason he wants to put it on Steam is he wants to generate the revenue to create additional levels, like a Plangman 1.5, Director's Cut, Extended Edition. Tell us what's the trading card doing. <coughs> trading cards? Yeah, Steam trading cards. Oh, Steam trading cards. Yeah. That's right. OK, I'll, I will suggest that. Thank you. Uh, another classic platform game is Impossible Mission. I believe it was popular on C64 and 8-bit Nintendo, but it was also for the Apple II. Anybody ever play it, this game? Yes, no? Two? Yeah. Two people. Three. He played on the Commodore. I will not hold that against him. So Impossible Mission. So you are a spy infiltrating this facility, and there are robots that are scanning for you, and you need to get the secret files, almost like elevator action, if you remember that game. He's searching the computer right now. There's a time limit until he can get the files he needs, and boom, you got him. <clears throat> and a modern game that's very similar to that is Master Spy. Another game I did an IndieSider podcast about. Uh, this is by a company called Turbo Gun, which is just two guys. And this is what it looks like. You're that guy right there, and you have an invisibility cloak. But when you use it, you can't jump as high or move as fast. And you need to get to the exit of each level without getting seen, without getting touched by an enemy or a laser. And you sometimes need to grab the key card before you can open the door. So right here, I have my invisibility cloak on. I'm moving really slow. I got to get around that soldier. And these two people in the gatehouses get that. Then jump up there. I can turn my Oh, I, I meant to jump, and I failed to jump. So then I have to start the level over. Really, really tough game. As you go on, there become robots, cameras, lasers, all these other different mechanics. It's always only one screen at a time. It doesn't scroll. But on some of the larger levels, when you get to the edge of the screen, you move to the other room. So it becomes multi-room stages, but only over one screen at a time. Uh, tigers. There are some tigers in this game. Uh, as soon as they spot you, they pounce so fast. It's so annoying. I've never been so grateful that tigers are endangered. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, the game Plangman is now $3.99 on their website. Oh, uh, Bill says that Man is now $3.99 on their website. Uh, when I got it, it was free. So, who knows? Uh, I have two more genres to go. Uh, do I have? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go quickly. Uh, Pac-Man, even if you're not an Apple II gamer, even if you're not a gamer, you've played Pac-Man. Everybody has played Pac-Man. It's a pizza with a slice missing, and it eats ghosts and pellets. Everybody loves Pac-Man. Here's what the Apple II version looked like. Much, much better than the Atari 2600 version. But that's not saying much. <coughs> uh, let's see, do we have sound on this? Awesome soundtrack. Love that. Waka, 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 waka. OK. And another game that just came out that's very similar to it is Pac-Man Pac 256. Originally came out for iOS, and now it's available for Steam and Apple TV and a bunch of other platforms. So this is named after the proverbial 256th level of Pac-Man. Now, as you know, 255 is the largest value you can represent in a single byte, which is how much space the original Pac-Man arcade machine reserved to represent your level. And when you got to level 256, the game crashed. <coughs> Same is true for Donkey Kong, as seen in the movie King of Kong. So in this game, it's an infinite maze, and you're constantly scrolling upward because at the bottom of the screen, it's starting to glitch. The game is glitching. And if you move slower than the glitch, the glitch will overtake you, and you die. Now, there are not just the traditional power pellets that allow you to eat the ghost. There are also power-ups, like you can shoot lasers out of your mouth, or lightning, or you can leave a fire trail behind you, and any ghost that crosses it will die. It's great. See, there I am shooting lasers out of my mouth. You can even change Pac-Man's color. Like, there can be a purple Pac-Man, which you've almost never seen before. 
Uh, it is a free to play game, which means it's free to download, and then they try to sell you a whole bunch of upgrades. But if you don't, if you just say no to the upgrades, then it's a free game. Or if you decide, I've gotten a lot of entertainment value out of this and I want to reward them, you can buy something. Sure, you can buy additional skins that make it look like an old Pac-Man game instead of a somewhat newer one. I understand the Steam version even has a four-player mode, which I have not tried. My last genre, and there's only two games in here, an old one and a new one, so I'll be short, is the role-playing game. And of course, Wasteland is a classic Apple II game. Uh, it is a tile-based game, somewhat in the style of Lawless Legends. In fact, I think Wasteland was directly inspired by Lawless Legends. And no, I don't have that backwards. And uh, you create your party, and you go around the world. And what I'm actually showing you here, it's, I believe it's the MS-DOS tile set, not the Apple II version. But what I'm showing you right here is actually a Steam game. You can go to Steam and download and purchase this game as you're seeing it right here. They have recreated or recompiled the original Wasteland as a game you can play on your modern computer through Steam, which is pretty darn cool. I believe Burger Becky is doing the same thing with Bard's Tale, that you can get the first three of those games running in a native environment, not emulated. So that's true for this Wasteland as well. Uh, but if you actually do want a slightly more modern game, also <coughs> available through Steam, again, I can recommend Wasteland. Uh, this was one of the most successful video game Kickstarters ever. Brian Fargo, who worked on The Bard's Tale and Wasteland, is, is in fact working on the new Bard's Tale, which contracted Becky for the remakes, uh, is now working on a new Wasteland game. Actually, I'm not so, he's not now working on it. It's been out for a couple of years now. They actually just had a PlayStation 4 release in the past year. And it's remarkable to me that he, this gentleman raised millions of dollars to do a sequel to an Apple II game. Granted, it was available on other platforms, but I think of it as an Apple II game. And there were enough old school gamers out there with money for a sequel that he raised millions of dollars before he was even done making the sequel. So you can get Wasteland. It's just called Wasteland. It's not Wasteland. Uh, it's Wasteland 2, actually, I believe. Yeah. Wasteland 2. You can be a desert ranger once again in this post-apocalyptic world and uh, enjoy trying to survive. It's, it's not a survival game like Oregon Trail, but as you can imagine, there are not a lot of resources after the apocalypse. Uh, so yeah. So those are some of the highlights of Steam. I had tons of others I could have put into this presentation, but I already am running long. So again, there will be links to all these games online. Uh, in the meantime, I have like a minute and a half for questions. Yes? So what Kirk Millwood just mentioned is that a lot of the games, a lot of the old games I mentioned, the original games, not the Steam remakes or sequels or inspired titles, but the old titles might be available on GOG, G-O-G.com, which is short for good old games. It's kind of like Steam, but it is intended to take the old games that don't run in modern operating systems and make them run in modern operating systems like the original Bard's Tale trilogy or Ultima. In fact, I think you can get some of the Ultimas for free. I think all 10 Ultimas are on GOG.com. Uh, so, oh, Wasteland, that's true, actually. Uh, so GOG is not exclusively for old titles. In fact, some games that come out for Steam also are sold through GOG.com, itch.io, humble.com. There are a lot of distribution platforms like Steam. Steam is the leader in the market but GOG specializes in not only those new releases, but also older titles. And as Kirk said, they are DRM free, digital rights management, which means they're not copy protected, if that's something that is important to you. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a great addition. Uh, I, like I said, I have enough games that I could do another session on this in a future year. But for now, I've already been uh, accommodated by Anthony and Henry, and I much appreciate your patience. So, Again, I will send out an email sometime in the next week with links to all these games. If you want to suggest any additional ones, catch me anytime. I'm here all week. Thank you.